Well, uh, today I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about a project that I'm going to work on. I should start by saying today is September middle something 2019. And about a year ago, um, end of August, I proposed to my special lady friend and to my delight she said, I guess so. Let me back up a little bit further. My person is not does not subscribe to the fairy tale wedding. Uh, she doesn't believe that she's a princess, and therefore, you know, she needs a giant diamond. Uh, no offense to anyone who thinks that diamonds are the only way to go. That's fine. To each their own. So, having been told, well, you know, I wouldn't really want a big diamond. Well, where the hell do I go from there? I spent quite a bit of time working on trying to figure out what kind of ring would I get her? Long story short, I found a guy that makes uh, Makume Gane rings, uh, custom rings, and I found him on Etsy, and I think he did fantastic work. Uh, he, you know, I worked with him and his team to design a ring that I thought that um, my person would really like, and it's incredible. I can't show it to you because she's wearing it today, but his storefront on Etsy is called Arn Krebs Arts, all one word. His name is Arn, A-R-N, uh, K-R-E-B-S, A-R-T-S, Arn Krebs Arts. I wholeheartedly recommend uh, you check him out. If you're looking for a ring, they're awesome. I, I think if you're going the non-traditional route uh, where you're not buying a diamond ring or you know, you're looking for a ring for yourself, um, you know, like a men's ring, check them out. Anyways, I ordered a ring, it was beautiful, but it came in a box like this. Um, you know, this is uh, a uh, cheap, uh, uh, and by cheap I mean, you know, affordable. Um, I'm trying to focus the camera here. Um, you know, pleather uh, ring box made in China. And it, it totally serves the purpose of a ring box. It holds a ring. Um, this was free, included in the purchase, but the ring is so awesome that this box just isn't good enough. Um, so uh, you, Arn and his team, uh, they sell uh, like an upgraded uh, wooden uh, ring box that is really cool. And I said, well, that's awesome, how much is that? And it was not cheap. Um, and it's branded, so it's got his logo on it. Um, so I was kind of like, you know, I just spent a whole bunch of money on a ring. I don't really want to spend a whole bunch of money on a ring box, especially a branded one. I just, I don't really care for that. So I kind of just looked online. I found uh, his ring box for sale on, on his website. And I looked at it and I said, well, heck, I can make that. So I went on eBay and I found a piece of uh, walnut burl and bought it. Uh, I don't have a handy right this moment, but what I made was this. It is almost a direct copy of the Arn Krebs uh, wooden box, but this one is way better because it's it's beautiful. Uh, I think the one that you can buy from Arn is, you know, it's a yellow wood, pine, or something like that. And, you know, nothing wrong with that. And it has a magnetic lid. So the lid is held in place by magnets. So I just recreated that. This is not perfectly square. I didn't try to make it that way. I just, I kind of made it in a hurry because I got the ring and I wanted to propose. I needed a box. So I just I made it quickly. Today's project is to make another one of these. This is um, this is my partner's ring box, and now that you know the the big day is uh, like less than a month away, um, I have a ring, but this is my ring, and this is the box, and I have more of the walnut left over, so I'm going to make myself one, um, and basically just make the same thing. Uh, it may look a little bit different. I think this is kind of chunky for. For what it is, so I think I'm going to make mine a little bit shorter. Um, but this is really simple, guys. It's just you cut yourself a lump of wood and you 
cut it again so you have two pieces and then I just uh, got a Forstner bit, drilled a hole in the middle deep enough to receive the ring and I put a little piece of fabric in there, I uh, glued that in with some uh, spray adhesive and then I just uh, marked out opposite corners and uh, drilled and sunk some rare earth magnets, they're pretty strong for their size and they have a corresponding set of magnets in the lid. The lid is literally just a piece of wood. I didn't do anything, I just sanded a chamfer on all the corners and it just snaps on like that. Um, and it, you know, it's on there. Good. So that is today's project. That is That was a long-winded introduction uh, and for that I'm not sorry. So let's get started. In a minute. All right, now we're in the garage and here is the remnants of my walnut burl. Um, the, the pattern or the figure in here is beautiful. Um, you know, the only bummer is there's some um, inclusions or bug holes or whatever down on this end. So, although this side has really beautiful figuring, uh, which is present here as well, these inclusions and bug holes are not really great. So I'm going to use this end here, and you can see I've already gone around and marked roughly where I want to cut. I'm going to cut on this side of this piece. This is going to be the, the box. My box is going to be shorter. Uh, it's just not going to be as tall. This end here has, or this area here has a little boo-boo. Uh, so once I get this cut off, I may um, run this through the table saw just to kind of nick. Fortunately, it's very shallow. Um, think. So I'll zip that off so it's not in there. I have a little uh, cross-cut sled um, that I made uh, for my table saw. It's pretty handy. Um, I definitely recommend if you have a table saw and you don't have a cross-cut uh, sled or cross-cut jig um, that you make one. Uh, it's worth it. It's very handy. Um, it's way better than the uh, chintzy little uh, miter gauge thing that came with the saw. Um, I have the orange brand of saw and the miter gauge that came with it just weeble wobbles in the groove, the miter grooves, or the lots of videos on the YouTube on how to make one of those. I'm not going to get into that. I'll cut it here and then I will clean this edge off. You know, I'll, I'll cut it in this plane to eliminate the defect and then once that is done I'll run the small block through that way um, just I'll be real ginger carefully uh, so let me get this table saw set up okay like I said before the plan here is to cut on this side of my line here this is my cross cutting sled um, so we'll cut this, and then once I have this cut, I will rotate the piece and nick that off. Um, let me just grab my ear pro real quick. All right, get that lined up. Watch your fingers. All right, so now that I have this piece, um, what I wanna do is use the block itself to judge how high I need to set the blade. Um, so I'm just gonna put that there, break that down a little bit, set this up here. And just zip that off. All 
right, now that I've got that cleaned up, um, this is the end that had that, uh, that defect. This looks really nice. Um, and now that this looks really nice, the opposite end uh, has a couple of little chips in it that before uh, didn't bother me, but now that this end looks real nice, uh, I'm gonna do the same thing to this end and just kind of zip that off so it's a little bit, um, a little bit neater looking. So, same as before, line it up. I'm really just trying to shave this down. That's all. I'm not taking. I'm not taking half a blade width. Now that now that I've got the I've got it the shape that I want it, I have to rip it down to separate the top um, from the base. So I'm kind of just looking at this and deciding. Okay, what? Which piece do I want to be the top? What? Which of the large faces here is prettier to my eye? This one is, in my opinion. So what I need to do now is, again, I'll just use the block of wood as gauge, run this blade up so I get an appropriate depth. I just want the tooth to stick out just above it. The less blade you have sticking out of the table, the better. The less likely you are to get something you don't want caught in it, caught in it. Um, okay, so now I have to do a little bit of thinking. I had, I haven't really planned anything. I don't have this like drawn out, um, but the lid needs to be deep enough or thick enough for me to drill and set a couple of magnets. Uh, the magnets are like an eighth of an inch deep. Uh, so I think I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna take a quarter inch, roughly. Again, uh, this is all just gonna be done by eye. Uh, I think that'll look okay. And I'm using, I'm using this slot here. You guys can't see it. You might be able to. The blade, you know, obviously is cut a groove here, and that's what I'm, I'm just lining this up so that way I have roughly a quarter inch uh, on the off-cut side. Um, ooh, this is going to be sketchy. Let me just take a minute and think of a... see if I can find a safer way to cut this. Maybe. Let's try it. I may just keep a finger on it just for extra measure, but I don't want to get too close. I'm pretty attached to my fingers. Okay, there we go. That, uh, like I said, if you can, if I could have cut the the top off while this piece was the rest was still attached to this, I think it's pretty clear that that would have been a lot easier, you know, to hold it way over here and have that come off. Um, but because I wanted, I want to leave this. Uh, as large as possible, so I didn't want to rip it the full length. Um, so now I have my two pieces, my bottom and my top, and what I'm gonna do, I think, is uh, I'm gonna take these back downstairs into the workshop, and I'm gonna start, I'm gonna do a little sanding ahead of time. Um, it looks like when it looks like there's a little bit of flattening that I need to do here. This corner uh, got a little bit, um, I'm not sure what happened. I don't know. It, it kind of tapers off. So when I put these two surfaces together, 
and push them. There's a gap here that's not present on this opposite corner. So I'm going to flatten the top and, uh, and then we can start drilling some holes in this thing. All right, now that we're back inside, I've got my um, flattening system set up, if you will. Uh, it's simply a floor tile, ceramic floor tile from the hardware store, and a piece of sandpaper. Um, these tiles are really flat. Uh, it's like the flattest thing you can get um, for not very much money. Um, maybe like a piece of glass, plate glass is pretty flat um, as well. But I, I like this for sharpening uh, edged tools, like hand planes, etc. Um, but what I'm trying to do, and I don't know if this will focus, please hold. So as I line these up properly here, there's a sliver of a gap in this corner that is not present on any of the other corners. So I'm not sure what happened, but somewhere one of these things got deflatified. Um, that's a technical term, of course. Uh, so what I need to do is I want to sand these two things so that way um, they are flat. In fact, I can see with my eye, my medium trained eye, that this corner here on the lid drops off so this is the bottom side of the lid and it goes like that corner goes like that and this corner the matching corner on the bottom does not do that so I will probably just sand this very lightly um, just remove some of the saw marks and this one will get a little bit more sanding I'm going to sand all six sides just to remove the uh, saw blade marks And, all right, that's all six. Now I can see this particular edge here. There's a low spot where the blade, oh, again, I don't, oops, sorry. I don't think you guys are gonna be able to see that. Take my word for it. You can hear my fingernail catches on it. Um, so that's got more sanding to do, which is kind of a bummer. So that means I have to sand the uh, the top of it also that much. This is going to take a few minutes, guys. So I'm going to shut the cameras off, and I'll just bring you guys back when I'm when I'm done with all the sanding. All right, here's where we are. I've got the <clears throat> the two pieces, the bottom and the top, sanded uh, just with a hundred grit, but with that uh, tile underneath it, I, you get a really good flat finish. So I can kind of wring these together, just rub them together to get the air out from between them. And it sticks. So my hand will drop before the wood. That's how flat and smooth these are. So anyways, got distracted by science. What I've done is I measured it's out of focus, but it doesn't matter. I've measured the uh, length and width here, marked out, found the middle, and <clears throat> I've got the Forstner bit that I'm gonna use in the drill press. And I've clamped a uh, piece of wood as a fence in the back, and I've got a uh, C-clamp here, so it's lined up. So it just goes right into that spot that little, uh, let's see if I can. <clears throat> the lighting in here is a little difficult, but anyway. Um, so the corner of the block just rests like that, and it lines up with the center of the drill bit. And <clears throat> the other thing I've done is I took the table, the work table here on the drill press, and I raised it up until the, so this is the quill, this part of the drill press that goes up and down is called quill. Um, 
So I can I, I went all the way down with that, and then I cranked the table all the way up until I had the depth that I liked here. I wanted the Forster bit only to only go so far, and so now I don't have to stop and keep looking to see oh did I go deep enough. I just I'll drill until until I hit the hard stop on the quill and that's the depth I want. So that's a trick that I like to do when I have to drill blind holes or a hole that doesn't go all the way through something. That that's how I you know I figure out where I want it to stop. Run the quill all the way down and then I'll run the table up and that fix that sets a fixed distance or fixed hole depth. Yeah. Oops, sorry. We'll see if I can adjust Ooh, too far. Get a little better lighting. <clears throat> Alright, so we're almost ready to drill this. I've already marked out, or I've already set the uh, drill speed to about 900 RPMs. Uh, that's roughly the speed I want according to a, a drill speed chart that I have based on the size of the drill bit and the type of wood. Um, let me see if I can set this camera up a little bit better. Let's drill this hole. piece of cake. And there's our hole. Um, this is, a, I've only ever used this Forstner bit um, to drill a hole like that in one of these. So that's only the second drill it's ever uh, drilled. Second hole it's ever drilled. Did I say drill? Whatever. So it's still nice and sharp. And you can see I got some really nice walnut curls there. Um, so that was the easy hole. That was the easy one. Now what I need to do is set this uh, system up <clears throat> to drill uh, holes in the corners for the top and the bottom for the tiny magnets. Um, so I can get this Forstner bit out of here. <clears throat> and so the magnets I'm gonna use, hold on, let me move the camera. All right, so the magnets I'm going to use are teeny tiny. Um, hold please. So the magnet I'm going to use is uh, pretty small. Um, it is, let me just stick it in my caliper here. It's just under a tenth of an inch uh, thick and the diameter is uh, roughly, it's just over, uh, let's see here, 0.225 inches uh, in diameter. Um, so I don't have a drill bit that is 0.225 inches. Um, and actually I would like it to be oversized because my plan is to use some super glue um, to hold these magnets in place. Um, so I just referred to my handy dandy uh, decimal equivalence chart. Uh, let's see here if I can show it to you conveniently. So reviewing the chart, let's see. Notice, uh, where am I? Here we go. So 0.225 is somewhere between a number one and number two drill bit. I don't have I don't have any number drills. I only have uh, inch fractional. Um, I don't have any letter drills. So the nearest next size fractional drill bit would be 15 64ths. I just so happen to have one of those and I just double checked um, by um, out of focus 
placing a magnet on the end of the drill bit and comparing and they are very 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 close imperceptibly close um, so what I'm gonna do is set up my uh, drill press fence system again um, so that way I can simply uh, take the piece of you know take the piece and just set it in a in a spot and it'll already be set up and the depth will be set so all I got to do is put it there and it makes it very repeatable and consistent um, so that's the goal so I'll, I'm going to shut the camera off and I'll bring you guys back once I have that set up it's going to take me a little bit of time um, to finagle everything till I get it where I want it and then once it's there it's pretty easy just to drill holes so I'll bring it back when I'm done Okay, so here's what happened. Instead I'd bring you right back and drill some holes, or I'd get set up and show you me drilling holes, but I turned some music on and got carried away and well here we are. So I wanted to give you guys a recap. Um, hold on, it's kind of dark in here. Let's see if I can... Whoop, if I can... There. So here we have the box, and um, I've not glued the magnets, but here's the problem I had. Um, remember earlier when I said that the wood is not perfectly square? Well, it's not, um, and I struggled for a few minutes anyway, probably 10 minutes, trying to get the a fence system set up on the drill press table and finally I was just like forget it I'll just draw that I'll mark it out using a combination square and a scribe which I did and I drilled the holes and this is the same thing that happened last time I spent mm, I, I really tried I genuinely really tried to lay these out in a way that the holes would line up but drilling by hand even with the drill press is not enough because when these magnets set up you end up with like let's see if I can get the camera to focus on this so you end up with magnets are not like pins okay if you can lay it out perfectly um, and put pins in it it'll be your two pieces will snap together just so but magnets are kind of you know, the free moving and or they have a field and because my holes are not perfectly lined up the two um, <sighs> words are hard sometimes the pieces don't line up so last time I did this about a year ago I hand sanded these pieces until there was no perceivable edge so it was like a lot of freaking sanding because it wasn't even close. Um, and I, I learned from that mistake of not doing you know, a good enough job of laying things out. So these are laid out better and they're still not, they're closer. I could probably hand sand these uh, in, into shape, but that's so much work. Um, and a year ago, I didn't have a hand plane. Now, I have a hand plane and a vise. So what, what I've done is I've put the magnets, um, oh crap, I gotta make sure I have this lined up properly. I don't. Ugh. All right, so this actually needs to be like this so that the grain matches properly, but I've got the magnets reversed, so they're pushing the pieces apart. So I gotta get the magnets out. They're just kind of press fit in there, and I can't quite get them out, so when I screw up, like right now, um, I've got a little uh, quarter 20 bolt. I put a little dab of super glue on it, and that's what I use to pull the magnet out. So 
Now I gotta do that. When you clicked on this video, if you thought you were gonna get like professional wisdom and a lot of really good how-tos, I'm sorry, this video isn't that. This is me just sharing my, uh, let's call it a journey. Uh, my journey uh, towards having a thought of, oh, I should do that, and then bumbling through all the little screw-ups I make along the way and coming out with a finished product that I'm happy with. Um, so it's, it's a very meandering path that I take because uh, I often have to do things four times. So let me get these magnets flipped around and I'll bring it back. Unless I don't. And we're back. All right, so I got the magnets flipped around. Um, this one still won't stay in the hole there. All right, so now these go together in such a way that the figure still doesn't match. Oh my God, seriously? You guys, good Lord. So what I need to do is get these uh, pieces lined up where the magnets will rest naturally, where the magnets are lined up. And then what I can do is use the hand plane to plane the surface of um, the four sides to uh, so that they're flush and even um, to kind of eliminate that little bit of a lip. Um, paying careful attention this time to make sure that when I put the lid on I have the magnets oriented in a way that um, the figure of the wood grain lines up because I've not managed to do that three times now. Lily, what are you doing? No, you're not supposed to be over there. And you have spider webs on your face. Fucking magnets. Freaking magnets. How do they work? Like science. Like what even is it? All right. Here, here we go. So now that I have the figure properly aligned and the magnets lined up properly also, the lid snaps on comfortably like this. This is where the magnets kind of become, I don't want to say neutral, but where they line up. And you can see, maybe you can't, maybe you can, there's, uh, there's, a, there's a lip where um, the lid doesn't line up. So all I'm going to do is uh, clamp this in my woodworking vise. I've got a piece of leather here that I'm putting between the bench dog or the vise dog here and the workpiece because I don't want, because this metal, this cast iron will crush the wood. And leave a mark that I don't want. So it's nice and tight, it's not going anywhere. The wood grain matches up. So now I'm just going to take my Stanley Bailey number five. This is the corrugated bottom. I made a restoration video on this. Um, this one's in rough shape, but it's sharp and it does a decent job. So let's see if I can use it to clean up Clean this up. It's gonna take some time here, taking light passes. I just have to get this close because I am gonna chamfer all the corners, um, which I did with um, the other one that I made. So uh, that chamfer will hide a little bit of the uh, misalignment, which is kind of nice, but I wanna get it really close. So. I'm just gonna, like I said, I'm just gonna plane these edges so that they line up, they're 
flush and uh, I'll bring you back when that's done. Okay, I've planed all the surfaces that I wanted planed uh, about as as close as I dare go with the plane because if I'm not a I'm not a professional woodworker I rarely use a plane and when I do I almost always um, snipe or uh, I'm not even sure that that's the right term but where you like you dig in at the last minute or too soon so like you end up with like gouges and I don't want to gouge this thing so I'm back to the sanding paper and the tile and I've got it pretty much where I want it um, magnets are still just pressed into place they're not glued or anything and I'm just carefully gonna sand I'm gonna squeeze squeeze this together real tight and just sand and that sandpaper will kind of finish off that last bit of uh, malalignment that I have here just to kind of clean things up and so I'm gonna do this for a few minutes and then um, then I'll work my way up through the grits um, I, I'll go to 400 and then 600 and I'll probably call it quits at 6 alright different day different flannel uh, <clears throat> yesterday I finished getting the magnets set in here um, that was a bit of a, a bit of a hassle because I'm a bit of a goofball and I kept putting the magnets in um, wrong polarity so when I went to put the lid on it would repel um, so if you're not an idiot and you understand magnets uh, that you know is not too complicated um, so what I want to do is I want to well first let me show you the magnets I did sand them they originally had a black coating on them I've sanded them so they're now like a satin silver color I just think that looks nicer and um, there you go just like that uh, I also sanded a very small bevel on all the corners um, especially focusing on the edge between the lid and the box because that small little bevel hides any well most of the imperfections in the not so perfect flatness um, and that's just a result of being cut on a table saw with um, not the sharpest blade you know if I had a better system and I you know you can do better than I did on this uh, but sanding a little bevel in there makes the lid stand out visually from the box and it also hides um, it hides those issues that I mentioned um, so what I don't really care for is on the inside of the um, little compartment here where the ring will rest there's you can see the pilot from the Forstner drill bit and I don't really like that um, and it's difficult to sand in here to make it as smooth as the you know the exterior so what I did on the other ring box was I took a little piece of fabric uh, from a Crown Royal bag and I cut it to match the hole and I just glued it into the bottom so I have here a small round piece of fabric and this is actually two pieces and I used this Home Depot brand uh, multi-purpose spray adhesive I just laid the piece of fabric down and sprayed it and then I stuck it to another piece so it's a little bit it's a little bit more rigid uh, which makes it easier for me to work with because what I'm going to do is <clears throat> I'm going to spray this uh, with the glue and then drop it down into here and press it in and it'll look nice because it'll hide that little dimple in the bottom and it'll have some fabric lining in there and uh, it looks nice so in order to cut this I cheated a little bit um, I know that this is an inch and a quarter hole and I just happen to have an inch and a quarter washer so I just used this and I put it uh, 
down on top of the Crown Royal bag and took a silver Sharpie, traced the outside, cut it out, and then just had to do a little bit of trimming around the edge so that it fit inside the hole nicely. Um, so let me, uh, let me spray this with glue and I'll show you me putting it in. Instructions on the back say uh, for a uh, permanent bond, apply a medium coat to one surface, allow to dry, to tack, and then join. Um, so all I'm gonna do is, let's see which side is better. This is the less nice side. So I applied a medium coat and I'll let it sit. Um, I'm actually gonna try to pick it up here because I don't want it to stick. I don't want it to stick to the cardboard. And I'm just gonna kinda blow on it so it dries a little bit faster. All right, let's see if I can do this while standing behind the camera. So here's the box, and let's see, we're getting there, it's almost tacky. So once this tacks up a little bit more, all I'm going to do is flip it over, sticky side down, stick it in here, and then I'm just going to go around the edge, uh, or the perimeter of the bottom and just push down to make sure that the edge of the fabric isn't like curled up on the side. All right, let's give it a shot. So the trick here is to get it in there. And again, like I said, I'm just kind of rotating my fingernail around the perimeter and pushing my nail down, making sure but I don't have fabric curled up like the side. I've got a little bit right here. Let me see if I can kind of pull the fabric just a little. Push that down on my thumbnail. You guys can't see, trust me. Okay, and of course, just push down on the bottom. And let's see if I can get the focus. So there it is. So at this point, all that's really left to do on this is to put some sort of finish on it. Um, <clears throat> I've actually got a couple of options. I have some some butcher block conditioner that I really like. It really is it, it's nice and shiny. Um, and I have paste wax, um, which is like a flooring wax. I think I'm going to try the I'm going to try the uh, the butcher block oil. So let me uh, change my camera battery, and I'll bring you guys back for that. All right, I've got a fresh battery, a paper towel. This is a one of those blue. Well, I think it's a Scotts brand shop towel, and I like these because they're lint free, lint free. Um, compared to like your regular white paper towels. And I've got some Howard's uh, Butcher Block Conditioner, which is mineral oil, beeswax, other waxes and oils. And um, <clears throat> I like it. And I especially like this. So I'm just going to put a little, <clears throat> excuse me, just a little blob here on my paper towel. And uh, this stuff gets really thick um, when it's cold because it is, you know, it's a wax. Um, it even says apply warm for best results. Um, so anyways, uh, these are sanded, these are both sanded to 600 grit. Um, and they're nice and smooth. So this, this should look nice. Let me uh, play with the focus here. <clears throat> so 
So basically I'm just going to buff this once it's uh, been applied. And the wood is pretty dry, so it's okay that there's a little bit of excess on here because the wood is, because it's so dry, it'll soak that up. So I'm going to let that sit for a minute. Start working on this piece. I'm going to need a little more. A little bit goes a long way. I want to get the inside as well. There. And there you go. Um, I'm just going to stand these up and let them air dry a little bit. Like I said, the wood will soak up a lot of that, uh, those oils. Um, I'm just going to let it rest for about an hour and then I'll come back with a clean, um, clean blue towel, blue one of these, and just buff it. And uh, that should be good. Okay, boys and girls, it's done. I uh, greased it up with the uh, Howard's Butcher Block Conditioner and uh, let it dry overnight. And uh, I just buffed it with a paper towel, and here it is. Like I said, the figure is beautiful, and you know it's got a couple of defects. You can see here some voids, and there's a couple there also. But just really a cool piece of wood. Um, and if you're wondering where I got it, I just bought it on eBay. I paid twenty-five dollars for a piece that was like a, I don't know, I think like ten inches long, and roughly roughly these dimensions here so I don't know if that's a good deal or not I don't know anything about buying fancy wood and here is the uh, you can kinda of see the fabric in there and I like the black because you kinda of lose sight of the edge of the fabric in the shadow so if you don't get it perfect, it's not super obvious. And the lid just snaps on. So. That's it. Um, you know, if you have a limited amount of time, um, you know, it seems like I've never been married before. This is my first wedding and hopefully my last. But it just is incredible how much time gets spent on the most seemingly inconsequential stuff like napkin colors. Um, so it seems like, oh, you know, I have all this time to figure out all this stuff. And then all of a sudden your wedding is three weeks away and you're like, holy shit, there's so much to do still. So a project like this, it took me about a day, not an entire day, but you know, it was most of a day of goofing around. And You know, if I had gotten the magnets right on the first try, I could have saved myself an hour. But if you don't have time, you don't have time. And you can buy a really nice ring box if you're looking for one. 
Um, me, uh, you know, working in the shop on something like this is kind of, it's cathartic. It's a break from, from the chaos of planning a wedding. It accomplishes two things for me. I now have some place to store my wedding band when I'm not wearing it. And it also kind of gave me a day off um, from the wedding, even though I was working on something for the wedding. So, you know, if you have time and, you know, the ability and the interest, go for it. You know, this is not complicated. Um, and you don't have to make it out of walnut, bro. You can make it out of pine. It's, it's not so much the material, it's the effort that you put into it um, that makes it special. Um, so, that's it. I, I hope that this was interesting uh, for somebody, and I hope it inspired somebody to, you know, make their own um, little jewelry box for a wedding or uh, as a Christmas gift for somebody or just for yourself. It doesn't matter. It's This was super easy to do. Uh, like I said, if I wasn't an idiot and I got the magnets figured out the, on the first try, this really would not have taken that long. Um, it's five holes and some sanding. So, um, and some super glue. That's it. Well, anyways, thanks for watching, and uh, I'll see you next time.